Analog horror is everywhere nowadays. The genre perfectly represents that eerie feeling you get when you turn off the lights and listen to an old vinyl video. It's the static on an old TV screen, the hum of a cassette tape, and the scratchy low quality sound of an old radio. This genre capitalizes on the nostalgia of the pre-digital era. It relies on the use of analog technology and practical effects to create a sense of dread and unease in the viewer. However, the genre is admittedly oversaturated. Because of that, unique ideas and innovations in the genre are much less common than they used to be. It's hard for a series to truly stand out. Despite that, one series that stands out to me in the analog horror scene right now is from a channel called Urban Spook. Both the premise and presentation of this series are some of the most unique and terrifying that I've seen in a long time. Be warned, this series is very intense. I may not be able to show everything for obvious reasons. And of course, big props to Urban Spook for creating this series. It will be linked down below in its entirety along with my social media which you should follow. As always, I hope you enjoy this video. Also, some of you will be happy to know that I finally opened a suggestion email for future video topics. The email is gearvidsuggestions at gmail.com. Very creative name, I know. Anyway, here you can suggest rabbit holes, video series, shows, movies, comics, other literature, including nonfiction, historical events, whatever, and I may just make an entire video out of it. To anyone who takes the time to suggest anything, thank you very much. Let's get into the video now. Now, before going over the series, I want to talk about art. More specifically, art that's created by people with mental illnesses. This vibrant, abstract, and sometimes grotesque category of art produces some of the most extreme pieces you'll ever see. The art that you'll see in these videos can be linked with severe mental illness, and the art can often be very abstract and unconventional in terms of color, composition, and subject matter. These works can be characterized by intense emotions and vivid imagery that reflect the inner experiences of the artist. Often, these paintings are created as a form of self-expression and may serve as therapy. However, there is a more specific group of mentally ill people that commonly make very unnerving art. Serial killers. Some of them have created paintings that provide a glimpse into their twisted mind and their motivations. Others have made paintings that are specifically for their victims. Take for example, Samuel Little. He's infamously known for an extremely long list of victims, confessing in 2018 to having up to 93. What he's not known for is his art. On October 8th, 2019, an article was published saying that Little had created portraits of his victims. The reasoning behind this was to help the police in figuring out who exactly he'd victimized that they hadn't already discovered. It's extremely disturbing to think about the fact that every single one of these images is based off of a real person, and that the person who took their life is the one that created it. Another even more similar example to the aforementioned art from the series itself is this piece by Andre Crawford, a man who victimized at least 11 women in the 90s. I'm unsure if this is an image of his first victim or just a mock horror movie poster, but the fact that this was created by a real person that took the lives of others is just particularly terrifying. Many others have created art as well, including John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, and Charles Manson. Gacy's paintings often feature clowns and other carnival imagery, while Ramirez's works are characterized by dark, ominous themes. Manson's paintings are often surreal and abstract, with references to the occult and violence. Analyzing the paintings of these people can be difficult, and it's important to approach the topic with respect for the victims and their families. However, doing this can also shed light on how severe mental illness and sociopathy can manifest in creative expression. And more importantly, that isn't just a concept confined to a fictional world. It's all too real. Now, let's get into the series. The first video was posted on November 3rd, 2022. This would mark the start of this analog horror series. The title of this video was simply, Analog Horror Faces. The video starts by informing us of three recently found paintings in an abandoned storage area, each titled after recent murder cases. The first victim was Carla Gray. He was found with 36 stab wounds to the face and had all of her teeth removed. This is what her picture looked like. The video continues with two other victims, Jackie Graham and James Miller, along with their corresponding paintings, which look like this. 
All of them lost their lives in particularly brutal ways, and this trend will only continue throughout the series. Two months after the first three paintings were discovered, several others were also found. However, the subject matter of these paintings did not seem to be connected to any known cases at the time. Weird. Let's see what the first painting looked like. As you can see, I wasn't kidding when I said the trend continued. The next few are also particularly brutal. The police made the case public in hopes of solving at least one of these cases. The killer decided to be bold, resulting in three more pictures. James Miller, Jackie Graham, and Jimmy. A final painting also comes in, this one titled, Self-Portrait. Pretty bold for this person to send a picture along with more evidence. It's also pretty terrifying how they depict themselves. There's something particularly inhuman about this picture, as is true about its creator. It's also interesting how not only are there so many victims, but that they've all been taken out in particularly cruel ways. It's beyond terrifying to think about how one would feel if they lived in the local area during this experience. I can imagine it'd be pretty hard to get some sleep at night. The second video in the series was posted on December 27, 2022 and is titled, The Lighthouse. It introduces us to a police officer named Bill Collins, who along with his wife and two daughters, had just gone missing. Before this event, Bill had discovered an unknown painting in his home which turned out to be a self-portrait. Remember that? They had no clue as to where this painting came from. Upon investigating, the police discovered one of his daughters, only two months old, dead and hanging from the ceiling of the attic. The police continued the search until 12 days later when the Collins family car was discovered near the ocean. Not only that, but inside was a painting titled Long Necked Angel, depicting the two month old daughter found dead in the house of the Collins family. This picture gave me a particular feeling of dread. I think the main reason for that is because this killer will effectively target anyone. There's no humanity to be perceived in this person anymore. But back to the story. The search then led investigators to an abandoned lighthouse just a few miles away from the car, where another unknown painting was found at the front door, this time red. After the police entered the premises, they discovered the charred remains of a missing teenager named Daniel Williams. They then searched the lighthouse thoroughly, and police found a tunnel with the remains of Jennifer White and her daughter Lisa White, who had been missing for seven months. Lastly, the police found a barrel containing mangled meat and bones that were later confirmed to belong to the rest of the Collins family, along with high volumes of amphetamine which indicate that the victims were drugged. This could mean that the suspect drugged them with this compound in order to kidnap them, or so that they wouldn't feel pain and therefore would stay alive longer as amphetamines can nullify those effects, especially in higher volumes. Scattered around the barrel were photos of the Collins during their gruesome killings. Among the earlier photos was another photo depicting an unknown individual. This person is clearly the same as the person depicted in self-portrait. Whoever this is, they aren't afraid of showing their face for some reason. Likely because this person doesn't care about anything but creating art. Aside from that, this video shows us the origins of Daniel after the fire, Lisa's secret face, and Jennifer's last stare, which were shown in the first video, Faces. The third video, titled In the Walls, was posted on January 9th, 2023. Corey and Margaret had gone missing 10 days prior, and their remains were discovered five days later inside an abandoned paper mill factory. Their bodies were found in a particularly gruesome state. Only Margaret's upper body and Corey's lower body could be located as their bodies have been sewn together haphazardly. The rest of their bodies have yet to have been found. Margaret's neck and jaw were broken in several places, and a clay brick with the word meat written on it had been violently shoved down her throat. Corey's genitalia had also been forcibly removed. A week before their disappearance, Corey had been dared by his friends to spend an hour in a remote cabin near Tiger Lake. Despite his better judgment, he entered the cabin alone with his digital camera, but just after four minutes, he ran out screaming and claiming that he had seen a face. 
His friends later reported that his left arm was severely bruised after this. During the investigation of the cabin, police discovered a wardrobe connected to a crawl space inside. Inside said crawl space laid Corey's camera. Despite its abandonment, Corey's camera actually did take some pictures. Investigators found the following images. The pictures mainly capture the floor, but the last picture gives us a clear look at the perpetrator. The police provided a phone number in hopes of gaining more information on the murderer, who, after being called, does not appear to be in service. The call ended. I paid my bill, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I'm gonna call again. Let me see if I got the right number again. Out of service. Somebody suggested we text it, so let's try that. I'll say I know who Jackie is. That's ominous. I can't say that I'm surprised that this person was living in an abandoned cabin in the woods. On January 27, 2023, the fourth video in the series titled The Clue was posted. Private investigator Sean Kane was aiding the police in tracking down victims linked to the paintings. Before his disappearance, Kane discovered the body of Tom Harris, who suffocated with hardened candle wax in his apartment. Both of Tom's arms and his eyelids were cut off. A third arm whose owner hasn't been identified was found in the wax with Tom's body. Along with this, the investigators found the following painting. A week later, Kane went missing from his home. When the police arrived, they found his dog severely beaten with two broken legs, somehow still alive despite being severely dehydrated. A blood trail leading from the bedroom to the kitchen was also found. The only clue that was found was the number 2 painted in blood on the doorframe that seemed to have been deliberately put there by Kane. Maybe this means it's two different people that look similar, or the second suspect on their list? It's hard to know. In Kane's bedroom, a painting titled The Man in the Pipes was found, clearly resembling Kane. The perpetrator entered through the basement, and a surveillance camera captured the killer's image before being destroyed. It looks something like this. This image looks more akin to someone wearing a suit of another person, very Ed Gein-like. This may also be the reason that Kane wrote two on the door, as it may be someone trying to appear like somebody else. The last video that we currently have access to is posted on February 24th, 2023. This one is titled, Witness. The video begins by recounting a recent incident involving Tina Rosenberg. She went missing three days ago with her boyfriend Jack Stryker and her younger sister, Flora Rosenberg. Jack wanted to celebrate his girlfriend's birthday. He decided to take Tina and her sister on a road trip to celebrate the occasion. Two days later, Jack's car was found in the woods, abandoned. Following an investigation, there were clear signs of a struggle inside of the car. Police also found a painting titled Flower Face Flora. It looks like this. The police heard screams deep inside the woods, and the screams led them to Tina tied to a tree. Her limbs had been severed, but she was still alive. Unfortunately, Flora wasn't as lucky as her sister, as she was found dead. Her face had been smashed in with a hammer. She was completely unrecognizable. Tina told the police that the killer was still present in the woods, but no one was found. While checking the car again, police found another painting that was left by the killer titled Long Jack, which had been hastily written on the back of the painting. Clearly this person didn't have a lot of time, yet somehow still managed to get it to police without being caught at all. This is what the painting looked like. Even more unnerving, Jack has yet to be found. After the incident, Tina would be interviewed by the police. This is what she said. I remember waking up in the car. Jack was gone and I could hear someone approaching. Next thing I remember, I was tied to that tree. I was injected with something and I could hear my sister screaming. She was screaming for our mom. Oh, Flora. I don't know. I remember whispering and her face. Oh God, her face. The police then sketched a picture of the murderer 
based on Tina's description. Very creepy. I wonder if the killer and painter are two different people? Maybe titling itself Portrait was to trick people into thinking they look like that when the true killer really doesn't? That could explain the whole wearing human skin thing. I don't know though, that's just my theory. Make sure you check out the series though.